So good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks, Paul, for the introduction that I didn't need it. <laughs> and I'll be talking about intelligence. And uh, intelligence is a combination of endoscopic and MIS. And, and bridging that gap um, is uh, what the system is like, uh, tries to do. Uh, I'll have a quick overview here right now, and then we'll go right over to the lab. So we have uh, roughly in half an hour to do this. So, um, so why, uh, why do we do intelligence? What is, what is the uh, impetus behind this? Uh, the uh, issue was, uh, as we all know, uh, with MIS trays, the smaller the incision, the more trays we have in the room, typically, the more equipment. Um, and what they were trying to do, synthesis here, uh, was to you know, narrow it down, make it more user-friendly and more streamlined. Uh, and we can see here a typical room with all the equipment that we have. Uh, what are the um, what are the issues right with MIS um, decompressions and uh, MIS T lifts? And we'll hear a lot more during the course uh, regarding these uh, limitations and constraints. But visualization is an issue. Uh, standardization, everybody does it a little bit different. You're going to, guys are going to hear a lot of different secret sauces here today, later today. Uh, and ergonomics, we've all uh, you know seen ourselves when you kind of like start tilting over in weird positions and hurting the next day. So those three uh, issues. Uh, were, uh, was, were addressed uh, with the new intelligence system. What is it? Uh, basically, it's a tower, a screen, uh, and an integrated camera. And the camera is really the heart uh, of the system. Uh, as you can see, the visualization is superb. Um, it has a tower, a, a sterile kit, um, and then reusable items. And we'll see all this in the lab. Uh, again, beautiful uh, 4K monitor. Um, and then one thing that is very intricate is the flush system. And you can see that, um, and that has been an issue with previous, uh, M we, we used to call them MED systems, uh, microendoscopic, uh, that the camera used to kind of fog up and be, uh, you know, get dirty. Um, and so that has been resolved with this uh, wash cycle uh, system. And you'll see that in action in just a second. Here's the uh, procedure kit, how do we get in there? Um, and a procedural uh, solution, uh, and it was uh, named uh, VooLiv, um, and it has nothing to do with Voodoo. Um, it has a visualization, user, and ergonomics, so that, that's what they put together there. Um, again, um, we have this here. <clears throat> Next slide. And so this is what I wanted to show you here, uh, is how the camera uh, is really superb. Um, it has... Uh, uh, off-axis visualization, that means that in contrast to a microscope, you have not only the panoramic visualization, but also off-axis. Again, we'll show that in the lab. Why do we need that? Well, you know, with the microscope, you're constrained by the tube. Once you have the endoscope and the camera in the tip of your tube, then you can suddenly look around and you see much more. And we can use that because often the nerve roots and the other issues that we don't want to damage during the procedure are close, but not within the field of the tube. And so off-axis visualization is just one of my favorite things about endoscopic and also about this system. Okay, so here we go. This We're going to see this in just a second in cadaver lab. Here's a cage goes in once the disk space is prepared. Um, and uh, here is uh, the different stages of the procedure. But all of this we're going to see here. Uh, and uh, here's a couple more slides, uh, you know, regarding, again, you're going to see this set in just a minute. Um, the kit that is always the same and standardized, uh, and the tower. Um, and so here's a, a case here right now, which uh, I think we'll just see life in the lab in a second here. So x-rays before, afterwards I'll flip through. Our, our specimen looks exactly the same way. Here's the setup. Um, and uh, here's a couple of intraoperative pictures here right now. All right, so I think we can... Uh, you know, uh, again, we'll demonstrate that in a second here right now. So you can see here that just one thing is uh, how they really got the, the imaging and the camera uh, settings really right. Uh, uh, next time you use an endoscope in, in the OR, just pay attention to the different settings. Uh, a lot of the color coding makes all the difference how you see it. So white balance it, uh, and you can see how, how that sort of really looks very authentic and realistic. All right, so all this we're going to do in the lab. Um, and I will be heading over there right now. Any questions so far? Uh, a great presentation, Christoph. You know, I, I think uh, we're starting to see a lot more of a trend toward endoscopic surgery or, or uh, visualization with a, uh, a camera. And it seems like the next sort of step from like maybe a tubular yeah. um, T-lift to uh, maybe this is like a hybrid in, endoscopic procedure, would you say? I mean, yeah. you obviously do endoscopic T-lifts, yeah, yeah. which is, I, I think, a little bit one step beyond this. Yeah. And so... Uh, 
Uh, would you say that's true? It's sort of the next step on that sort of spectrum? The, the way I see it, it's, it's really a bridging technology where they have adapted some you know, pieces of full endoscopic to, uh, you know, full, for the full endoscopic system, but also you know, left some you know, familiar things with tubular retractors. Uh, and so it's really a hybrid. Um, and so I think it's going to be, um, you know, as you know, we're collecting a lot of data. So I'm really curious how outcomes are going to fit into this. But I think it's a, it's a really neat, uh, you know, meaningful idea to fill that space. Um, and I'm not sure you mentioned it, but what size is a tubular? It's not quite tubular. It's sort of like it, oblong. Or the, the, right? the tube is actually tubular. I think it's like uh, 17 millimeters okay. or so, uh, roughly. Roger, Dr. Hartle. Yeah. Hey, uh, Roger Hartle from New York. Thanks for having me. I had a question about the um, the camera primarily. Uh, it, it sounds like an amazing idea, an amazing system. Uh, but a lot of T-lift surgery then, unless you are of the philosophy that you really want to stay away from the dura, uh, but in, certainly in my practice, frequently there, there is a component of decompression there. Yeah. And, and I've, I've tried various exoscopes over the years and, and various other technologies. I, I've tried this camera in the lab, I, but I can't really assess the quality. But I, I was just wondering, how does it compare in terms of the image quality, especially if you work around the dura, if you do like a decompression or over yeah. the top decompression, is it really as good and as safe as a microscope? A microscope has an unmatched image quality, in my yeah. opinion. No, uh, Roger, you bring up a really good point. Um, the question here is right now, right? Digitization of the image, how much information do you lose? And anybody who's tried an exoscope has seen that, right? When it's a, just a slightly pixelated, it's hard to kind of you know perceive the dura and other structures. Um, you'll see it in there. I think the camera technology is really some of the best on the market here. So it's really nice to see the camera. The image quality is certainly not a limitation of this. It's it's. I think it's better than a microscope in terms of visualization, right? Um, and so the other nice thing is you can look around the corner, uh, which is really really nice because especially in larger patients, uh, you know, it's, it, it can be challenging. So uh, so I think that's a, a really good idea. Um, and I think now we just have, you know, it, you know, the implementation is happening right now, and I think it's going to be really interesting where it fits in. But uh, certainly the system allows for decompression surgeries too, Roger. So you're over the top. Uh, decompression can be done with this um, for sure. Um, it, you know, Roger brings up a great point about this, and you know, it just reminds me of like, you know, when you're uniportal for, an, you know, this is your endoscopic expertise. Uh, Uniportal, really, you lose that three-dimensional, I think, perception, right? Yep. And some people argue with like biportal endoscopic surgery with that second camera, you get some depth with it. And so I, I feel like this intelligence is really 2D, right? So when, when you're doing overtop and assessing dura, I mean, your depth of perception, yeah. I mean, I, I think you can use your sucker to help out a little bit. Um, I mean, what do you think? A microscope is three-dimensional for the most part. I, yeah. I mean, I don't know what your thoughts are on that. You know, I, I, I think it's a it's a learning point for surgeons. If you're used to using microscopic surgery and you have to go to 2D, I mean, you lose that sort of depth. And it's it's subconscious, actually, yeah. when you do it. No, I think you bring up a really good point. I think Roger's point, the image quality, it's superb. Um, the, the, de de the depth perception uh, is something that, as you see, uh, you know, we under, as surgeons, we often under, underestimate uh, the, the value of proprioception, right? What we get from our hand position and all this stuff. Um, and so uh, you'll see in the lab, uh, if you, I'm sure you can play around a little bit with it afterwards, but, um, you know, by having the tube anchored there, it really helps you also to kind of get that depth, uh, you know, figured out. So, so, but it, that's definitely, it's not three dimensional. So it's definitely two dimensional. What helps is that panoramic visualization, right? Because the camera is down there which means that even the smallest movement changes the size of the object because it's just so close to the camera. And so you uh, somehow our brains are picking that up very quickly. All right. One other question. Yeah, Bruce McCormick from San Francisco. You know, I went to China, and all the disc surgery is done endoscopically. I mean, all of it. And it's just, I was always, you know, could never figure out why it really never took off in the United States in the same way. And well, I asked Chinese surgeons, they said, well, we didn't have microscopes, and yeah. so this is how we trained. But yeah, well, we have this bridging technology, but you know, you don't have to go to China, just go across the street and everything is endoscopic too. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> but you can go to China. So, uh, you're at UCSF, right? Is there a lot yeah. of endoscopic spine surgery being done? Well, you know, Bobby Tay, but yeah. not, I can't say a ton. 
Yeah. Yeah. It's Bobby Tay, yes. Yeah. But most of it is, you know, standard open, very large cases. Yeah. I mean, it is exploding in popularity. Yeah. It really is. I, mean, yeah. I think the younger generation are going yeah, but I can never figure out to me why it's so popular in China or other countries. And to just, it is a smaller segment of the spine uh, practice in the United States. Yeah. But growing. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, uh, Paul Holman from Houston Methodist. So, uh, Chris, um, you're fighting this battle every day with the economics of endoscopic surgery. You know, there's a lot of value to the patient, but there's an additional cost. So, how do you see the cost of this technology comparing to the microscope and whether or not it's yeah. going to be frowned upon from our hospital administration? Yeah. I think it always comes down to if you see the value of an intervention on a societal basis or on a case-by-case -case basis, right? Uh, there was a study from the Netherlands where they looked at, uh, you, know, you know, the value of endoscopic technology such as, you know, intelligence similar to that. Uh, and on a societal perspective, so what the whole country pays for it, it's highly valuable and highly effective. Uh, on a, because it can often replace larger surgeries, right? Um, and so our system in the U.S. is not designed according to this uh, because the value and the, the, the money savings for a country and the systems is tremendous. Uh, on a case-by-case -case basis, we fight, like, you know, you know, like Paul said, we're fighting the fight every day. So um, I think that's 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 that needs needs to be determined here right now. And again, we ha we're going to have a half an hour in between the uh, non-CME and the CME, so we can actually continue maybe that discussion. Uh, this would actually be perfect for the break, if you don't mind, Paul. Perfect. And I'll head over there right now. Get some rest. Thank you. Great.